It's such an honor to be here. Um, yeah, know many of you over the years, but definitely many new faces all over the Eastern Cape. I am a Kabecha boy myself, a PE boy myself. I try, I fail. But um, <laughs> I, I was here till age 11 or 12 before we moved to Cape Town. And so I love Port Elizabeth. I always say to people, if there was a place I could live, if it was just up to me and my own like selfishness, and I could live anywhere in South Africa, it would be Port Elizabeth. So um, you love this city. Just trying to win favor with the crowd, you know. Um, <laughs> and uh, maybe also East London and Port Alfred and Adelaide. And here. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no. So um, I really do want to just dive in because I am trusting God for an encounter with Him tonight. That is the point of, I suppose, every time we get together in the name of Jesus. It's not just, you know, um, to go through the motions. It's to encounter the living God because we come to Mount Zion. We come to the heavenly Jerusalem like we're just reading about. And we come through and to the sprinkled blood of Jesus that cries out for forgiveness. And so there is this incredible opportunity for us to meet with our God. The thoughts uh, that he has concerning each one of us outnumbers the grains of sand. The psalm tells us in Psalm 139, it outnumbers the grains of sand in all the world, in all the beaches, not just King's Beach or Summer Strand or whichever beach, like just imagine all the sand in all the world. This is for all eternity. He has been thinking an uncountable number of thoughts about each one of us. It is incredible. In, in one cubic meter of sand, apparently there is up to a billion little specks of sand. Just one cubic meter. Can you imagine all the beaches in Port Elizabeth? This is our God. And He wants us to know Him. He wants us to know this love. He wants us to be secure and confident in this love. And I want to preach tonight a very simple message. It's about living in the Father's love. And I was thinking, is this the kind of message you preach at an equip? Is this going to equip God's people for works of service? But to be honest, when I think about it a little bit deeper, I think I don't know any other message that could better equip you to be a saint in service of God in His kingdom. I don't know if I know another better message. I was driving in the Netherlands with a group of young people the other day, and we were coming back from playing soccer together. That's what we do on these apostolic trips, you know. That's why you travel thousands of miles and all that. No, I'm kidding. But it was just a wonderful time with the guys, and we were, and they were asking all sorts of questions, and we were chatting. I mean, literally just firing questions. In fact, the guy who was asking questions all the time was Tom, who used to be here. Just firing question after question, like, 10 o'clock at night after playing soccer while we're eating McDonald's, driving like an hour back. Anyway, and um, he said, what? We were talking about, you know, the up and down nature of Christians, how sometimes it's, you know, it it's, can be this blowing hot and cold. It can be this, um, these highs, these big highs and lows and pulling away. And he's saying, how do you stay consistent in serving God? Like what's the one thing you would say is most important in staying consistent, in, in staying zealous and fervent for the Lord? And immediately, the, the first thing that came to mind, because this has been my experience, is knowing the love of the Father. That's like, like, that was it. I was like knowing the love of the Father and I was just thinking like, I need to preach on this. This is actually so important. It's the most important thing that we can know in many ways. And that's, that's what I want to do tonight is just convince us to learn how to come under the waterfall of the love of God all the time, to keep coming back there. So um, negatively speaking, one of the greatest enemies against God's people is what would be called maybe a number of things, an orphan spirit or whatever. Um, I like to just call it the spirit of rejection. The spirit of rejection. And I, I, over the years, so many people I've seen set free of the spirit of rejection because rejection and feeling rejected, abandoned is similar to that. Feeling on the outskirts is something that almost every one of us at some point or another suffers with. And it's something that the enemy is constantly trying to get a foothold into our lives and exploit that thing. 
How many Christians over the years have fallen away from the Lord, from the church that they're serving in and passionately? How many Christians have fallen away because somewhere along the line they say, well, you know what? I just feel like I'm, I, I just don't feel like I fit. I don't feel like I belong. I don't feel like I'm recognized or people care or love me. I, I just, ugh. And, and what you, and often, often there's truth to it. I mean, come on, we're not perfect people. We want to be like Jesus. We want to love like Jesus. But sometimes, of course, we're going to get it wrong. Of course, church is not going to be this place of perfect love all the time. The fathers will be, though. <laughs> and, and you've got so many Christians sitting on the outside that sometimes I think like, well, now you belong again because there's so many with you on the outside feeling the same way. Now you've got a nice group again. You know, and that's what they do. They form their little groups on the outside going, the church doesn't love me and this and this and whatever. And then, and then form their own little way of doing church. And then it just repeats the cycle, repeats the cycle. Why? Because there's a love deficit that only the Father can fill. And He longs to fill. And the spirit of rejection needs to be driven out of us. As we, as we live in the confidence and assurance that God wants us to live in. And Satan loves to dig these deep holes in our lives. I don't know how he, how he dug it in your life, how he dug it in my life, I'm quite aware of. But maybe for you it was just seeing parents that were always conflicting with one another, hostile in the home. And, you, and deep down as a child, you looked at this and you thought, you know what, this is supposed to be the most beautiful loving relationship that there can be on the planet. You know it intuitively. My parents are supposed to love one another, but there's hospitality, there's rejection, there's fear, there's anger, there's pushing away, there's running away. And you look at that and go, well, certainly there's no love that can exist then that is, that is just so, in a sense, unconditional and pure and beautiful. And you start fearing, well, I'm going to be rejected just like my father was constantly rejected or just like my mother was constantly rejected. Maybe they loved you, but just watching their example made you feel, ah, oh, I'm not secure. Or maybe it was the way that they treated you. Maybe it was the neglect. Maybe it was the hostility. Maybe it was the anger. Maybe it was the inconsistency towards you. I don't know what it looked like for you, but usually something has happened in our lives because the reality is, is that every one of us has got this, this hole that the enemy is trying to dig deeper and deeper. And he's trying to fill it with all sorts of things. And that's what drives us. That's what causes us very often. I'm not saying it's the only reason, but very often that's the motivation behind us that drives us into the world, into achievements, into the comforts and the lusts of the flesh, into all these things. It's driving us. There's this, there's this inner desire because you're desperate to fill that deep hole that the enemy is just digging deeper and deeper. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, actually, I, this, I saw this the other day. It says this. It says, do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Notice that. The love for the world is driven because you don't have the love for the Father in you. When the love for the Father's in you and it's filling that hole, oh my goodness. Now you're not driven. And what does it do? For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and a pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. So there's all these things. I don't want to focus too much. I mean, you know the story. Come on, it's the story of all of our lives in some way. But the Father wants to heal this. Positively speaking, I want to say the love of the Father is the most, I, I believe it's the most powerful force in the universe to heal, to restore, and to be the source of all, all that we need in the Christian walk. And to be honest, over the last couple of years, I have seen a trend. You know, at one stage, the Holy Spirit was the one that no one would speak about in the Trinity. It was Father, Son, and Holy Scripture, but there was no Holy Spirit, you know? But recently, and I think it's because there's such a bad understanding of fathers, recently I've been thinking, you know what, in my circles, in charismatic circles that I'm in, people talk about Jesus a lot as the Lord and the King and the one who worthy is your name, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And they talk about the Spirit a lot. Oh, you know, welcome, Holy Spirit. You're welcome in this place. You're welcome. We honor the Spirit of God. We honor His gifts. We honor His fruit. 
But I found that less and less there's a, there's a real desire to speak about and meet with and speak to and honor and know the Father. <clears throat> Even though this was deeply on the Father's, on Jesus' heart and on the Spirit's heart, is to cry out in us, Abba Father, and lead us to the Father. <clears throat> so what's... Um, Positively, it's one of the greatest forces that can ever restore and heal. I'm telling you, we've got a friend who runs a children's home similar to um, John King there from East London, and it's, it's called the Almond Tree Village. It's a big children's home. They take in babies, abandoned babies. They've probably got about 60 babies at any given moment in one of their big houses. It's an incredible place. But when you hear of the stories, to be honest, I don't want to hear of the stories of these children. Most of the time, I'm just like, please don't tell me anymore. If they start sharing about why some of these babies of how they're abused and abandoned and how they're taken away from the most terrible environments and the kind of injury and physical, just how they're marred by what they've grown up in. I'm like, please, I don't even want to know. I don't even want to hear about it. And partly that's partly because I've got two adopted daughters and I always just think this could have been my daughters, man. And so they come to the Almond Tree Village and they've got such deep rejection, abandonment issues. You're like, how is this possible that this child is ever going to live a normal life? Ever. They've, they, surely they are marked and ruined for life. But what they've come to realize as staff that all love the Lord and love Jesus and love the Father in that place is they've come to realize that the power of God's love can heal anything. And they've tra trained their staff to push into the love of God, to pray prayers over these children from when they're young, to, to just say, God, only your love can restore. And these children are thriving. They're full of life and joy and worship. They're living heal whole lives. Obviously, they've got things to work through. But it's incredible to see because of the love of our Father. It can heal anything, anything. In Ephesians 3, verse 14 to 21, you know this prayer. Paul prays a prayer for spiritual growth. That's what the NLT, it says, Paul's prayer for spiritual growth for the Ephesian church. How's this for a prayer for spiritual growth? You know, when you think of spiritual growth, when you think of maturity, you think, Lord, teach them, train your people to grow up, to be more consistent, to be more faithful, to be more servant-hearted, to be more disciplined, whatever it might be. But I love it because Paul, it's like he goes right back to the source of everything when he prays this prayer and he gets down on his knees. When I think of all this, Ephesians 3, 14, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your heart so that you're, you will trust him. Your roots will go down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep is his love. May you experience the love of Christ though it is too great to understand fully, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Lord, make me complete. Other versions say, make me mature, but it's more than just maturity. It's wholeness in every area of my life. How do I get there? May they be made complete because their roots are going down into the love of God. The eyes of their understanding and their spirits are being blown wide open to know the height and length and width and breadth of the love of God. Oh, he's falling on his knees. He's praying for them because he knows this is what's going to make them a mature people. What's going to make us a people that are consistent? It's if we learn how to be a people that are consistently standing under the waterfall of the love of God, the Father. Come on, oh Lord. And I, I, I wanna be careful. I mean, I know that you can preach one emphasis of God's character at the expense of another. 
And if we only preach this message only, we will become unbalanced, obviously, in our theology. I mean, we've just read in Hebrews 12 about uh, the reverence and the fear and the awe because our God is a consuming fire. Like, like, but at the same time, there's reverence and fear and awe because with Him there is forgiveness. And so there's this, this mercy and fear and reverence and love and desire. It's kind of like Esther approaching King Xerxes. There's this deep reverence, almost like crawling up to him, knowing that the power of, of her future is in his hands. But at the same time, there's this knowledge of the intimacy that she has with him, knowing that he longs to give her like up to half his kingdom if he holds up his scepter. It's this fear mixed with desire, mixed with intimacy. But the Father wants to call us to this. And then Tom, this young guy from Oxygen Life who's now serving in the Netherlands, he, he asked me, he says, well, have you had any encounters with God's love? And I thought, you know what? The most significant moments of my life have been encounters with the Father. Really. I love Jesus. I really do. And I don't want to play one against the other. I mean, that would be just crazy. Like Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Father is God. We know this. But I'm telling you, the most powerful encounters for me that have changed me in in the most deepest ways where I'm, I'm changed, I believe, for life and for eternity have been encounters with the Father. I remember once being on the Isle of Man ministering there on Father's Day. And they said, well, can you preach on the Father? It's Father's Day. It was after a conference. I said, yeah, that would be amazing. I thought that I had some good knowledge about the Father and I'd come a long way myself in understanding the Father. And I went for a run and I, I, I was sitting on a, like a, a little peak um, overlooking the sea somewhere in the freezing cold wind. Or, you know, it's supposed to be summer, it was freezing. But um, I was sitting there and, 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 and I'm preparing and I'm praying for the next day for the service and I get a call from one of the guys. And this, this call is saying, hey, and I want to take you shopping. Can I come pick you up? I'm like, wow, that is so random. As I put down the phone, I feel like the father says to me, you don't really know who I am yet. If you want to preach about me, I'm going to show you what I'm like. I'm going to show you the lavishness of who I am. So I go on this shopping spree with this guy that I hardly know from the Isle of Man who just heard the Lord tell him that he needs to take me shopping. If the Lord speaks to any of you, you know, just obey him quickly. <clears throat> And he takes me, eventually I'm so, I'm like struggling because everything I look at, he just buys for me. Like, it, it was like scary. I'm like, I'm scared to pick up anything in the shop and look at it like, wow, that's nice. It's like, oh, just, just let's buy it. Let's just get it. Let's just get it. Come on, let's just get it. But all the while, the father is behind this experience going, I wanna show you. Oh, how great the love the father has lavished on us. We are called sons of the living God, children of God, daughters of God. And, and I realized, oh my goodness, there's still so much I need to know and learn about my father. I remember another time, um, I probably was about, I don't know, maybe 25, 26. At the time, I probably felt, felt quite old and experienced and I was pretty confident in ministry. But I think I was starting to realize that I actually really don't know anything. You know what I mean? Like you, you, at 23 years old, when we planted the church in Cape Town, I was like, yeah, you know, we can, this is, I, I know. I mean, I'm, I'm ready for this. This is what I'm made for, you know. I've waited years for my inheritance. It's finally coming, you know, at 23. And then, but by about 26, I think I was starting to realize like, oh my goodness, like, yo, I don't know if I know that much. And, and uh, I remember Andrew phoning and saying, I'm gonna be away for one of the big Josh Jen gatherings probably about this size in terms of people, two different meetings, you know, to get all of Josh Jen in those days into, into the building and for us to have a gathering together. And he said, I want you to minister at both gatherings. And I, I mean, obviously I was like, yeah, of course, of course I will. You know, at first I'm like, this is going to be amazing. I'm very confident in those days. But then it started to hit me like, oh my word, oh my goodness, Oh, Lord. And I remember going out to one of the parks in Cape Town and just like sitting with, just going out with God and just going, God, help me. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know if I'm ready for this. I don't know if I've got anything significant to give. 
I don't know. And almost feeling like, God, I don't know if you're going to back me up. I don't know if you're going to come through for me. That's how you're thinking. It's really all about you um, at that time. And, and I remember the Father speaking so clearly to me and saying, do you not think that I want you to succeed way more than you want to succeed and do well? Do you not think I desire that far more for you than you desire it for yourself? And it really, it hit me. It, it, it marked me. It changed me. I was like, whoa, I need to know God. I need to know the confidence He wants me to walk in. Not mine, but because I'm backed by the love of the Father. Oh, man. These things, and, and I can remember many moments since then where in times of discipline and correction, the Father has come close to me and He's loved me and He's changed me and He's corrected me. And it, when I thought I was going to be pushed away and shunned and, and kind of shamed, He would come close and show me how much He loves me and delights in me. And then He would correct me and change me. I'm telling you, it's encounters with the Father change you forever. The Holy Spirit was all about this. Jesus was all about this. This is what they wanted for the people. Um, in John 14 verse 8, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. I, I believe this is the cry of like the whole world. They don't know it maybe. Maybe they don't know what they should be praying for. But I believe the world who was made for a relationship to be reconciled with the Father, what they're deeply crying out for is this, Lord, just please show us the Father, then it'll be enough. It'll be satisfaction in every place in the deepest levels of my heart forever and ever if I will just see the Father. And Jesus obviously says to him, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Don't you know me? Haven't I shown you what the Father is like? And you just think, Jesus, you, the Father's just like Jesus. Wow. The, well, Jesus is just like the Father, perfectly representing Him. Jesus, the one who calls young men out of, you know, the stands and gets them to stand on stage and they don't know why they're here, just because He wants to call them out and honor them and, and love them in front of 800 people. Like, this is Jesus who says, Zacchaeus, oh, here you are. Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your home. I'm going to eat with you. And you just realize this is the Father's heart. In all that Jesus did, He was going, I want to show you what the Father's like. And in those last few days, while He's teaching His disciples those last most important lessons, He says this in John 16, uh, or oh wait, where was it? <clears throat> yeah, in John 16, verse 25, He says, Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. Jesus wants us to plainly know about the Father. Plainly teach us. This is who the Father is. I don't want you to be confused about who the Father is. Then he says, in that day you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you've loved me and believed that I came from God. He's like, listen, I want you to know you don't have to just relate to me or just even through me, but in my name, you can come to the Father and speak yourself. Part of the whole reason for my coming to you is to show you how to pray, Abba, Father, hallowed be your name. And all through Jesus' ministry, he's just constantly praying and speaking to the Father, so much so that the disciples, it's like they, they're desperate to, to know the Father as well. Show us the Father. We want to know the Father. We want a relationship with the Father like you have. And Jesus is going, yeah, I definitely want you to have that as well. That's my purpose. And then you read in Romans, similar in Romans 8, where it says the Spirit testifies, cries out with our spirits. Abba, Father, is crying out. Father, He's the Spirit of adoption. The Holy Spirit, Jesus, they want to reveal the Father to us. Does this make sense? I, I've God, I, Father, I pray that you would encounter us tonight. I pray that this wouldn't just be theory. Teach us, Lord. So what does the Bible say? about this kind of love, the love of the Father. So I want to read two scriptures from John again. John 15, verse 9. It says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. I'm just going to read that again, because that actually 
is one of the most mind-blowing things. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. You see, when we talk of the Father's love, we're talking of the same love with which He loved Jesus, His eternal Son. Jesus is going, that same love that I am loved with from all eternity past, the eternal Father loving the eternal Son with an eternal love, no limits, no boundaries, infinite in every direction, that eternal, everlasting love is the love with which He loves us. Jesus goes, that's the same love I love you with. John 17 says very similar thing. John 17 verse 26, it says, I have made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them. The love with which you've loved me may be in them. If you wanna know what kind of love does the Father love you with, just think about how much he loves his son Jesus. It's not less. It's not less in quality. It's not less in quantity. It is the same. The, the, what Jesus, what the Father's inviting us into is the love that the Trinity has for one another in the Trinity itself. Like that's what the Father is inviting us into. That's the love. It's not like another category of love for human beings. It's the same love. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. It's the same love. It's like, we're, this is why he says it's beyond what we, our minds can understand. Because even as I explain it, I can feel the walls. I can feel the walls on like, whoa, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Really? Are you sure? Like maybe? I wish. No, it's the same love. It's the same. This is the word of God. We believe it or we don't believe it. Believe it. Like Seth says, you can come or, you, or not, but please, we prefer you to come. Like we prefer you to believe the word of God. This is a good thing. Oh man, and so the picture I have of God's love is like the, the, the Victoria Falls. And it's just like there's this constant pouring of more water than you could ever possibly need to the guys in, in Port Elizabeth. You're just like, oh, this is amazing. Like, I don't know if you remember what this is like. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm talking about waterfalls of love. I'm not talking about even just like a five minute shower, which some of you would be like, this is, that would be incredible. Like, that's what I'm longing for. You know, I'm talking about never ending waterfalls. And when you go to the top of the waterfall, you don't just see one river that could run dry flowing towards the waterfall. You see a forever ocean. And I've always got this picture of God's love, the Father's love. It's a forever ocean flowing over a waterfall. And it's like the Father's going, I want you to come and stand in this all the time. I want you to remain in my love. Remain in my love. <laughs> in oh Man, there's so many beautiful scriptures. I'll, maybe I'll just read Isaiah 49. This is when the people of God are are being taken into captivity and all the prophets start speaking to them and saying, you need to remember who God is in your life, that He's for you. The Lord came to us from far away. Oh no, wait, what? Isaiah 49, verse 14. Zion feels forgotten. They feel like the Lord has, has abandoned them. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Listen to God's answer. Can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb. Even these may forget. Like, it's possible that the most crazy, deranged, or, I don't know, drunken mother might forget that most powerful instinct of wanting to nurse her baby who is completely dependent on her. Like, it, it, maybe it's possible that a human being might forget Yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. This is our Father. This is our God. I will never forget you. Psalm 
So you can live in this or you can choose not to. You can remain in it or you can not remain in it. The, th the love is always there. The waterfall is always there, but it's up to us to remain in it. He says, remain in it by obeying my commands. Learn what pleases him. Learn to obey him. It's not like you're earning it, okay? He's not saying, if you obey me, you will earn my love. He's saying, if you'll obey me, you'll, you will be living in my love and you will experience my love and you will stay in my love. It's like if you stay in the boundaries of this building, this is where the love of God is. It's almost like that. If you go out the boundaries, it's not that his love has stopped for you. It's just that you're not gonna live in it and remain in it. And he's going, come on, remain in my love. Come back to the waterfall all the time. Oh, there's so many, there's just too much scripture actually about this. So, this. This is one of my favorites. I've got to go here. Romans 8 verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now that's a beautiful quote, but it's backed up by proven love because this is what it says. Like the reason God is so for you, do you wanna know the reason why God is so for you? Well, it says in the next verse, verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Lord, will you provide? Lord, will you back me up? Lord, do you actually love me? Lord, can I actually trust you? God says, come on. Do you know what I did to my son for you? What I allowed evil men to do to my son for you? And it, and it was my desire and will because I love you so much. Get it, Caleb, quickly come here. This is my son. He looks a lot like me. I love him so much. Like deeply, deeply love my son. If someone had to break in here with a gun, a bunch of gangsters of some sort broke in here with guns and they said, that's it. I'm going to kill all these people in this room right now. Unless you allow me to murder your son, then I'll spare them. Now, as much as I love Caleb, I would look at that and I would go, okay, Caleb, I love you, my boy. You're going to, you know, I mean, in this case, I can say you're going to be in eternity with Jesus and I'll see you again. But okay, fine, you can, you can do that to my son for the sake of sparing all your lives. And I think I would, with, with anguish, I would make that decision. But here's the thing. If I had given my son, Caleb, for you guys, I, I, I think I would live the rest of my life with everything in me to make sure that your lives count that everything I can possibly do for you to count, I would do. For you to make it, for your lives to be, to be beautiful for, for, for Jesus and for his kingdom, thriving in every way. I would give anything for you. That's what God is saying here. Thanks, my boy. He's saying, don't you know how much I will, I will give, spare nothing. I've given literally the, everything I can possibly give, the one I love since eternity past. How much more will I not give you all things? I didn't even spare my son for you. This is the proven love of our Father. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Hmm. And then he says in that same scripture, you can remain in my love. And he says, you will, I want you to have this complete joy. If you remain in his love, he says, there is a completeness of joy that you can have. Not just your own joy, but my joy I will give to you so that your joy will be complete. The joy I have of experiencing my father's love is the joy you're going to have if you will remain in his love. And you think of a world that is, is so battered by depression and suicide and hopelessness and all these, all these things flying around, maybe even in this room. And Jesus' word over your life from John 15 is, may your joy be complete. How? Because you can remain in the love of a father, perfect love. Think of, the, think of the, the, the descriptive words, the adjectives used for God's love to try and translate the Hebrew word for love. It talks about unfailing. It talks about enduring. It talks about everlasting. Everything about God's love. He's trying to say it's so consistent he is the father of the heavenly lights. All good gifts come from him. He doesn't change like shifting shadows. James says, 
It's not like other lights that kind of have shadows cast and stuff. He's saying he's greater than the stars whose lights we can count on for all the years of our lives, that they will always be there. He's like, this love, it never changes. It's so consistent. He is the immutable God. He is unchanging. That's one of the the attributes that makes him God. If he was changing, he would stop being God because it means he could love more or less at any given moment. He would stop being holy and infinite in all of his nature and his ways. No, his love is always, always, always the waterfall flowing. Always. (laughs) Oh, Lord. And I'm, I'm gonna bring this to a land soon because I want us to just encounter the Father's love for a moment. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Mm. Not only does He adopt us, not only does He accept us, but He actually enjoys us, guys. Many people, they get to a place where they say, okay, so I'm part of His family now. Thank you, Lord. But does He enjoy me? He enjoys us a lot. I mean, the more you love someone, the less it takes for them to please you. The more I love my wife, the more that, you know, that means that anything she does for me, I'm just like, oh, thank you. You please me so much. I remember my little daughters growing up. And, you know, when they learn to walk and they, all they do is they smile at you and come to you when you call them. Like, come here, my girl, come here, my girl. And, and I mean, they're not doing anything very grand or spectacular. And most of the time, they're not that amazing. You know what I mean? They're like, they're actually quite difficult and awkward and they cause your life to be hard. Um, but because you love them so much, the slightest little thing that they do, and you're like, oh, you please me and delight me so much. You're the joy of my life. You know what I mean? If I'm like that as a human father, how much more our God? And so God looks at us and he goes, oh, you're giving a cup of water to one of of my children? Oh, I'm gonna reward you for all eternity. I'm so pleased with what you just did. It's like, whoa, that's like quite imbalanced, isn't it? It's just a cup of water. God's like, you will not fail to receive your reward. He loves to, he longs to. Because he loves so much. Can you displease him? Yes, you can. But here's the thing. When he disciplines you, it's never in wrath, anger, or condemnation. Because that's been used up on Jesus. He is the propitiation. He has satisfied the wrath of God. He has drunk to the dregs the cup of God's wrath. Okay, Lord, take this cup, but not my will, but your will be done. I will drink the cup of wrath. I will drink the cup of condemnation. And, I, and here, my disciples, take the cup of the new covenant of my blood for forgiveness of sin. And so when he disciplines us, Hebrews 12 tells us that he does it because he loves us. And it quotes Proverbs. Listen to this, Proverbs 3 verse 11. It says, my child, don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when he corrects you. That's pretty difficult. A lot of us, I think, reject it. A lot of us are upset by it. A lot of us maybe shy away from it because we don't get the heart behind it. But this is what it says. For the Lord corrects those he loves just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. His discipline is not just his love for you. It's because he delights in you. And you bring him such delight that he wants to correct whatever he needs to correct so that there can be closeness and intimacy. His discipline is not just so that you can do better and represent him better and be more better. (laughs) His discipline is so that you can enjoy holiness and fellowship more with him because he delights in you. When you realize that that's the motivation behind it. Oh, it just changes everything. I don't know where you're at, but in the story of the prodigal son, let's end with this. He comes back, he comes to his senses and he says, I'll, you know what, at least the father will take me as a hired servant. You know, that's what many of us are like. 
We're like, I'm no longer worthy to be a son in the house. Deep down, we believe, I don't know if I'm worthy to be a son. And so what do we do? We go, okay, well, let's just start a transactional relationship with God then. I'll do good things and then hopefully he'll do good to me. And if I'm bad, he will do bad. But hey, I mean, that's just fair, isn't it? And we think, let's just relate to him like this. And so the, the son comes up with this plan. I'll just be like a hired servant in the home. And he starts walking back. He's still got, he's got filthy rags on. He smells like the pigs he's been working with. But the Bible says from a long way off, the father sees him and he is filled with compassion. The father doesn't see the son returning to him and go, oh, it's about time. Or, oh, let's see if the world taught him a lesson. No, it says the first thought in the father is he's filled with compassion as he sees his son coming. And then it says the father starts running towards him, running. This dignified father, ruler of this estate is just charging towards his son. And when he gets to his son, his son starts his speech. Father, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But he interrupts the son's speech. The son hasn't even finished. And it says he embraces the son and he kisses him and keeps kissing him. And that's the Greek there. The Greek is, is, is it, all the different commentators say the same. It's like you're kissing, but you're kissing and kissing and kissing and kissing. <laughs> it's like, I mean, if, you, if a father ran up to the son and, and hugged him and kissed him, the son might think, well, he's doing what a father should and now he's gonna correct me. No, but the father just goes beyond that. He's like, I'm, I'm not gonna, I don't even wanna talk about it. Of course I can see your repentance. You've come home, that's what counts. Now all that matters is that I restore you as quickly as possible to be a son in the house. And he starts kissing him and convincing him by his kisses that there is a lavish love for you. And then he says, oh, quickly, servants. He's not even listening to his son's speech. Quickly, bring the best robe in the house. Bring the best robe we have. Bring the robe of the righteousness of Christ and make sure that they're clothed with it quickly. Make sure they know how clean and perfect they are in my sight quickly because Jesus paid for it. Bring the ring that signifies that this is my son and that they have an inheritance in the house. They might have squandered it and wasted it, but the fact that they've returned to me, I'm gonna use all things for good and I'm gonna restore their inheritance. And it's not too late. And bring sandals for the feet so that they don't walk around kind of, you know, destitute and and looking like people without shoes or with ugly shoes. Often that's what it tells you. It tells you that these guys are coming from poverty. It's like, I don't want any son of mine to be in poverty. Put sandals on his feet so he can get to work in my house again and have purpose again. And then he says, kill the fattened calf. Oh, the one that we've been saving. Let's have a party so that all of the household will know that we are not gonna treat the son with any shame. We are gonna celebrate that he was dead, but he's alive, he was lost, but he's found. I wanna make sure that everyone knows how I feel towards my son. And it's celebration and it's joy and it's festival. This is the father. It's not too good to be true. It's his idea to create more people like his son and to conform them into his son's image and to love them with the same love with which he loves Jesus. Could you close your eyes? Oh, it's so important tonight. It's so important that we respond to this love. This love, it's got to be more than theory. It's got to be more than the great scriptures that I've used, which are the eternal word of God. It's got to be more than the pictures and the illustrations. It's got to be an encounter with the living God. It's the most powerful force in the universe. I remember a young or a man in our city bowl congregation in the middle of Cape Town coming out of prostitution, male prostitution, and the most crazy life you can imagine. I remember him one day going under, just falling on the ground as the love of God started to wash over him. And we didn't know what was going on. We just saw this. We just saw this. this, Something was happening. He had this beaming, shining smile on his face when he got up. We said, what, went, what happened? What just happened? And you could see he was different. 
He said, I've just been invited into the love of the Trinity. At that stage, I didn't even know what all the stuff I know now that I'm preaching. I didn't even know if you're allowed to say that. But he, he said, I've been invited into the love of the Trinity. I was, I was in the middle of their love. <laughs> and he was changed. I don't know if he remained in it. I don't know. I don't know. All I'm saying is, can we remain in it? Can we come under the love, the waterfall of the love of God? If you this evening, if you this evening are going, I need to, I need to come to my senses and I need to return to the Father and to the Father's house. Something in it, I've become transactional. I've forgotten about who my Father is, but I need to come under the waterfall. I need to, I need to obey Him, yes, but the whole point of it is because I need to be reconciled to my Father. Maybe you've never experienced it. Maybe you have no idea what I'm talking about, but something in you goes, yes, I want it. If that's you if, you, if that applies to you in any way, would you just come right now? Just come right to the front. Just get out of your seat. Just come. Just come stand here. We're going to pray for you. The rest of you can stand if you want to. Just, 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 if that's you, come. Let's respond to him. Just say, come, Father. I need you, Father. He can do something tonight, which I believe can change you forever. For the rest of you, why don't you just, maybe just stand, open your hands. You've been sitting for a long time. Can we just get into a, into a, a, where we just go, okay, just for a moment, let's come under that waterfall.